Welcome to Module 1 of Middle School Science Preparation for the Praxis. This module is a partnership with TLC Tutoring Company and Arkansas State University. In this first module, we are mostly talking about the nature of science and specifically how it relates to engineering. So science and engineering are closely related but distinct fields of study and application. So science is the broader, the body of knowledge that explores the physical and natural world. So it's very broad, but it's about studying and gaining knowledge. It's utilizing the scientific method. So a, question, uh, a scientist begins with a question to be answered and a hypothesis to test and conducting experiments to test that hypothesis. Scientists start with wanting to describe and understand the world around them. How does the world work? Why are things the way they are? It's a pure knowledge play. Engineering, by contrast, is the application of knowledge in order to design, build, and maintain a product or a process that solves a problem or fulfills a need, i.e. a technology, something that is solving a problem, and often this will result in technology, something that actually does solve that problem. So engineering uses what we would call the engineering design process. Uh, an engineer also begins with a problem, but then they identify the criteria and the constraints that they have in place to solve it, and then they create technology, and then they improve upon their design. So you can see the flow of information is similar, but not the same. Engineers really design solutions to problems intended to better the lives of those in the world. They're not purely after knowledge, they're after applications, problem solving. So both fields are important, but they differ both in general approach as well as their goals. Now, scientists share certain basic beliefs and attitudes about what they do and how they view their work. And these have to do with the nature of the world and what can be learned about it. So science is based on empirical evidence. Empiricism, empirical evidence, means physical, observable truth. Evidence that we can base that. That's how we make scientific decisions, is we don't just have guesses, we have evidence that supports the things that we believe. Now, there are multiple methods to apply that scientific method to study the world around us. You can perform experiments yourself. You can research experiments that others have done. There are many ways to do the scientific method, but they're all based on, again, number one, empirical evidence. Now, models, laws, and theories explain natural phenomena. Now, these are all similar words, but all they really mean is a theory is something that has a broad background on it but maybe has not been proved mathematically. Once it's proved mathematically, that's a law. And then a model might be how that math is written out. But they explain natural phenomena. Scientists have the belief that the world itself is understandable. The universe, the world, why things are the way they are, how they behave, that it is understandable. We all start with that underlying belief. Now, in science, major concepts are developed over time, and they are subject to revision. They can change when there is new evidence to consider. This is one of the greatest advantages of science, is that science is not fixed. Science is always improving, always changing, and that means that science 50 years from now will look different than science right now, which looks different than, you know, science in the 1960s. And so that is one of the great things that happens. They're developed over a long time, and they can change. Now, finally, while science is separated into domains of study, different disciplines, you know, botany, chemistry, uh, you know, uh, physics, different things of that nature, cross-cutting, that's moving in between disciplines, and processes help, they round out our concepts and processes and helps us all improve. That's one of those great advantages, again, of why science can be so powerful. Now, let's talk a little bit about engineering design. As we talked about, it differs from pure science in a few regards. Now, engineers will define problems rather than asking pure questions. They're looking around the world and they're saying, what do I want to know? They're not saying, what do I want to know? They say, what do I want to solve? And then we identify criteria and constraints. Now, there's always a criteria of what says, how do I know the problem is solved? And the constraints are, you know, do I have a certain amount of money I need to use? A certain amount of energy I can use? What constraints are there that I could have used to solve the problem? Now, engineers are going to design and test and evaluate possible solutions 
with respect to how well they meet the criteria and the constraints. Answers to questions alone will not necessarily solve the problem. Knowledge alone won't solve problems in many cases. You have to take it a step further. Now, once they have a design solution, it is optimized through a systematic process of modification and testing. So try something, modify it, try it again, modify it, try it again, analyze, improve, modify, test. Engineering is by definition iterative, so it's always changing and it rolls and rolls and rolls over. It's always cycling and improving. Now, we talked in room about the nature of science and we talked about the nature of engineering. Well, in both of these cases, safety and emergency factors are a very important part of this. So we want to spend some time in this first module talking about these. Now, obviously, these are going to vary depending on your lab context, but this is a list of things that you need to be thinking about as you are applying scientific methods in your classroom or in your experience. So first thing to think about is fixed equipment. Where is the fixed equipment in this? Your safety equipment, so your eyewash station, if something's getting in your eyes, your safety showers, your fire extinguishers, things that are fixed that are around the room with you. Now, second is talking about appropriate apparel, as well as the behavior of your students or even yourself as an instructor or those around you. So this is are you wearing the right personal protective equipment, PPE? Are you wearing, you know, goggles, appropriate clothing, sleeves? You know, are, are, is some, are people wearing like long jewelry or things of that nature? Are people horse playing in your classroom? These are things where when you're setting up a lab, we have to be thinking about this. Next would just be emergency procedures for minor burns and other injuries. So, in the lab context, there is a probability that at some point you're going to have at least some minor injuries. This is the nature of what we do. So we do everything we can to prevent those in the first place, but also if they do happen, that we're prepared. So minor burns, you know, the, where, where's your first aid kit? How are you going to report this? How do parents need to know what's going on? In the same way, you're likely to have some mishaps at some point. You know, students spill things and then you'll have a chemical spill at some point or possibly, you know, a fire. This can happen. So how are you going to handle that? How do you evacuate the building? How do we safely put out something like that? A chemical fire is not always the same as just a paper fire. And in a broader sense, what are, are you aware of your potential hazards around you? So this is allergies or asthma, environmental hazards. You know, are you in a building that has asbestos? There's one of these things that you need to be aware of as the instructor, as the leader in your lab context. Next is the procedures for safe and correct preparation and storage and use and disposal of materials. If you're going to be using chemicals in your classrooms, in your lab context, we have to make sure that we are preparing them properly, we store them safely, we use them properly, and we dispose of them properly. That we don't just dump it down the drain, right? So that's one of those things that depending on your context, you're going to want to make sure you have this in order. In related to that is the safe storage of all your materials. You know, we have to make sure some things need to make sure they don't get hot. Some things have to make sure they don't get cold. Some things need to be outside of direct sunlight, making sure you understand your material and that you safely store them. Then, you know, additionally, you're going to have proper use and safe disposal. So that's biohazards, sharps. If you're using syringes, do you have a sharps container, a safe way to dispose of these where no one's going to get poked? We obviously don't want to just throw that into a trash can. And finally is just proper selection and preparation of the space and the materials. How are you going to lay out your space? How are you going to use your laboratory setup? Especially if you're in a space that is not always used as a lab. How are you going to lay things out and do that? And this is something that you have direct control over, so you want to make sure that you spend the time to think about it. Now here's some specific equipment factors that you want to consider depending on your lab context. So, do you have the familiarity with the standard equipment in the laboratory and the field? You know, do you understand what these things are for? Obviously, there are lots of different things, you know, uh, burners and uh, you know, lab microscopes and sample kits and all these sort of things. What is it that you need to be most experienced with? Making sure that you are exposed to it, you know how to use it, and that goes into the next one. How do we use these appropriately? 
we've all had students probably who have gotten into these who they think it's just really cool to play with it. How we use that equipment is the, is the expectation that we can set. So there's balances and Bunsen burners, graduated cylinders, rock hammers, all this stuff. Things that are the great part of science. They're really fun to use, but we have to use them safely and, prop and properly. Now, in the same way, we have to you know, care and preparation and maintain our equipment. You know, a microscope that is not properly maintained is not much good for anything. So we have to make sure that we are storing it, we're cleaning it, we understand how to take care of it, and that it's always ready for use. And finally, the use and proper care of our personal safety equipment. So fume hoods, if you're mixing chemicals, making sure your safety goggles are in good shape, your waste containers, uh, your lab aprons, things of that nature. Is it all in good shape? Is it being maintained? Does, does everyone in the class understand how to use it? And are you confident in sharing that? And that completes module one about the nature and impact of science and engineering. So module two will start science, technology, society, and the environment. We'll see you on the next module.